Okay, so yesterday we began talking about the Georgia Constitution of 1777, Georgia's first plan of government as a new state, recently separated from Britain. Um, talked a lot about Button Gwinnett, who, if you look at his picture, he needed to shave when he sat for that portrait. Um, but we talked about Button Gwinnett, we talked about Laughlin McIntosh, Lachlan McIntosh, rather, and the duel that takes... Gwinnett's life, um, and then, yes, but I sent it to you in an email. Why do I keep saying that? You're welcome. It's the last copy I have. Um, we talked again about the duel that happens between Gwinnett and McIntosh and why. Um, McIntosh calls Gwinnett a liar and a rotten scoundrel. And Gwinnett challenges him to a duel. What was Gwinnett's big mistake? He challenged who? A professional soldier. Um, both are wounded. Gwinnett, um, of course, dies. Then we talked about, we began talking about his efforts to create this Georgia Constitution um, in 1777. Um, and we talked as we were leaving yesterday, we, <laughs> we said that, uh, that's funny, you just have to see that. We said that um, it was not a constitution that was ratified by the people. In other words, the people don't get to vote on it. And because they don't have a voice in that, it really doesn't represent their interest. Are y'all from the same cartoon or? Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Just check it. Um, I thought you were lying, but anyway. Um, we talked about the weaknesses of the Constitution of Georgia. And even though it is very weak, it is the state's constitution for 12 years. Um, and that coincides with the Articles of Confederation that we'll go ahead and start discussing right now. Although we do have to look at John Trutland first. Um, John Trutland, the only reason he's up there is he is the first constitutionally elected governor of Georgia. Uh, May 8th, 1777, he's actually elected by the legislature, not the people. But that's how the Constitution was set up. Um, he actually takes over for, if you can think about dates for a minute, um, he takes over for Button Gwinnett. You're exactly right. Nicely done there, young Mr. Zecca. All right, so here's my question. This is where we're really going to start today. <clears throat> the Constitution of 1777 gave a lot of power to the legislature. The legislature typically upholds the rights of the people and not to the governor. Why do you think that was such an important issue in 1777? And if you want a hint, I'll draw you a picture. You ready? You want a picture? Don't laugh at my picture. It is a federal offense. You can go to jail for laughing at my picture. It's a wart with hair growing out of it. Yeah, King George. You're exactly right. I don't know how you ever guessed that. But it is King George the Third. That's that's why the legislature gets all the power power, power, power. Who do they represent? No, who does the legislature represent? Who do they work for? No, they work for who? The legislature. It's right there, which typically upholds the rights of the people. So the legislature works for the people. They're interested in the rights of the people. The king is not. 
And they felt like if they gave power to the governor, they'd end up exactly where they started, and they don't want that. And so that is significant in 1777. It's an important issue, not just in Georgia, but we're going to see that on a national scale here in just a minute. All right. So the Articles of Confederation. Um, it's easy for us to remember the Constitution because we've had it for so long. Not so much the Articles of Confederation, but it's important that we look at them. Um, they are the foundation of this new government that is started by this new country or this group of people who are trying to become a new country. Um, it is, in its first draft, it's written with a very strong central government. Think our United States government today. That is a very strong central government. Think King George III with the Harry Wart on his chin. That was a very strong central government. Okay? Um, and the Articles of Confederation initially is written like that. But guess what? States don't want that. They're opposed to that idea. It frightens them. It um, brings up memories of living under King George III, taxation without representation, quartering soldiers, all of those things. And so they are opposed to it. Um, they're in the process of winning their freedom. They haven't gotten it yet, but they're in the process of winning their freedom, of taking their freedom, and once they get it, they don't want to give it away. And so um, when they create this government that begins this new nation, they do not want a strong central government. So who has all the power? If it's not the central government, who has the power? Nope. Nope. Think about 13 individual states. Who has the power? The states. Okay. <clears throat> Here is the Articles of Confederation. Um, all I can read in it, just from looking at it right here, is to all to whom. Why? Because that's in really big writing. Um, it, it's very similar to um, what the Declaration of Independence was written on, what the Constitution was written on. In, in reality, it's about that size. It's a big document. Um, and this would be the pretty one. Okay? Um, the one that most people would read would be like that newspaper kind of thing we looked at yesterday. Okay, this would be the engrossed copy. This is the one that we would put on display. Like if you go to the National Archives and ask to see the Articles of Confederation, some dusty librarian would go and find that for you. It'd be scary too. All right. <clears throat> the states don't want a strong central government, so they set up a very weak central government. And the states get the majority of the power, the majority of the authority. They are able to run their own lives, so to speak. They have authority over their own states, not the central government. And again, why? Why, I ask? No. Well, they don't want to be under the same kind of rule they were with King George. And so the states, well, he's bald. You know, he's got male pattern baldness. He's bald right here. That's why he wears the crown. So, the, again, that's based upon their experience with King George III, with the British monarchy. They don't want people telling them what to do. That's what it boils down to. They don't want to be told what to do by a strong government. And so, as a result, they get this plan of government 
these articles of confederation that are really, 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 really bad. You get that? What are they? Bad. It's too limiting. It limits the federal government or that central government from doing the things that a government has to do. And so the government, the nation, does not run very smoothly. And we're going to see why. It's pretty obvious when we start looking at some things. First of all, uh, let's look at what the Constitution or the Articles of Confederation enabled the central government to do or the federal government. What could they do? Well, they could declare war. Okay? Keep that one in mind. Hang on to it. Put it in your pocket. You're going to need it in just a minute. Declare war. Who declares war today in the United States? It is not the president. What did you say, Frederick? Congress declares war. Always has since the Constitution was written. So when's the last time war was declared by the United States? When? Keep going, Frederick. You got it. You got it. You had it. 1941. This war was declared by the United States on December 8th, 1941. Never was a declared war. Neither was Vietnam. Neither was Korea. Te technically, the war in Korea is still going on. We've never signed a peace treaty. We signed an armistice. We won't fight. It's an agreement to, to stop fighting. Okay? So, under the Articles of Confederation, the central government can declare war. We can declare war on Dakota Stan. Okay? As the president, ah, but there is no president. We can coin money. Now, what does that mean? Ah, there's a nickel. There's a nickel. We can make this stuff. Can't make paper money. But we can make change. We make coin money. Why? Because this is actually worth something. There's metal in here. There's nickel in here. And that nickel is worth something. The dollar bill that's in my pocket is just paper. Well, it's cotton and linen, but it's paper. It's not worth anything. So they give the authority to coin money, but not print money. And then they can establish post offices. It's an important thing. I mean, you know, I guess. Pretty cool. And they can send and recall ambassadors. So the central government sent Benjamin Franklin to France as the U.S. ambassador. They could send a letter to him in France saying it's time for you to come home. So they could send and recall ambassadors. So there's four things they could do. Which one did I tell you to hang on to? Declare war. Okay. Well, you can hang on to that coin money thing too, but declare war is more. Now, this is what they couldn't do. This is the powers that the government did not have under the Articles of Confederation. They could not levy taxes. And some people would go today, woohoo! No more taxes. What's the what's the problem with that? How are we going to pay for stuff? How's the government going to pave the roads? How's the government going to provide those post offices? Pay for an army, a navy, a marine corps, an air force. How are we going to do that? Taxes are an important part of life under a government. If we don't pay taxes, then we're not going to benefit from certain things. So instead of levying taxes, they had to go to the states and go, please, sir, may I have a dollar? And the states could go, well, sure, we're feeling generous today. Take two. 
or they could go, no. And central government had no recourse. They could not regulate the trade between states. Okay? Hey, if, if we wanted to look at the Constitution as far as what it says about trade between states, we would find states, the trade between states is regulated by the federal government. Why? Because it makes trade between each state fair and equitable for everybody involved. Under the Articles of Confederation, South Carolina and Georgia could enter into a trade agreement. Georgia could levy tariffs on South Carolina. South Carolina could levy tariffs on Georgia. That's not the case today. If I go to Virginia and I buy peanuts, I'm going to pull out my $10 bill, whatever it is, hand it to them. They might give me change. They might ask for more money. Um, they're not going to ask me what state I'm from. They're not going to ask me, are you a Virginian? Where are you from? And then set the price based on that. The price is regardless of where I live. Well, I don't smoke, so that's not an issue for me. Neither do you. Okay. Gas. Okay, that's a good example. But they don't ask me where I'm from when I go buy gas. Right? But it is more expensive in some states than it is in others. But that has nothing to do with where I'm from. That has to do with the taxes, um, how easily accessible it is, a um, lot of different things. Okay? Um, and even that's regulated by the federal government today. Now, they could not raise an army without the state's permission. So basically, the country is defenseless. Now, what did I tell you to remember? They could declare war, but they can't raise an army. Hmm. Does that sound a little odd? They can declare war. We're going to attack Dakota Stan. Uh... Miss, Miss Campbell, can we have an army, please? Okay, we're not going to attack Dakota Stan then. Although we could just fling cheeses across her borders. Okay. <clears throat> so that that is a tremendous weakness in the Articles of Confederation. It gave the, the federal government some power, but not nearly enough. It gave way too much power to the states. And the states can't agree with each other. What? So, some serious weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. Um, it has a very strong legislative branch. In fact, that is the only branch. There is no executive branch. There is no judicial branch. There's no federal court system. No national court system. And so if Georgia and South Carolina get into a dispute, instead of the federal government stepping in and going, okay, boys, just, just break it up. What's your problem? What's your problem? And coming up with a solution, it's South Carolina and Georgia going to go fight one another. Yeah, I'd like to fight South Carolina. I don't like South Carolina. Why? Well, Hilton Head is not technically a part of South Carolina. It's just in South Carolina. All right. Um, each state has its own currency. Remember, the federal government can do what kind of money? They can coin money. They can't print money. Each state prints its own money. So, again, I'm going to South Carolina. And... I want to buy something. I have to have South Carolina currency in order to do it. They're not going to take my Georgia currency. It's not worth anything. So I have to go to someone who exchanges currency and get South Carolina money. Huh? You have Indian money? I have Confederate money. Right over there. Next to George. Um, so each state has its own currency. Congress. Congress can make law. They just can't enforce it. That's like, you know, the state of Georgia setting the speed limit at 65 
but then not giving the Georgia State Patrol the authority to enforce that speed limit. What are people going to do? They're going to go as fast as they can go. It's going to be like the Autobahn in Germany. Just zip it around. Okay? Or, you know, maybe it's like when your parents tell you not to do something or there are going to be consequences and you do it anyway and there are no consequences. Okay? Next time you're going to think, well, they didn't do anything that time. I'm going to do it again. You do it again and there are no consequences. What have they just told you? Do what you want to. We're not going to enforce the law. Okay? So that's a huge problem with Congress. And and this one may not seem like much, but it really is. Each state, when it came to national matters, each state had one vote. No matter how many people lived in the state, each state had one vote. Each state assembly could vote. And that's all the votes they had. So, Virginia is the most populated state during this time. It had the same number of votes as the least populated state, which was Georgia. What? Okay. And so, that's a real weakness, and that's a real um, bit of inequity because every person should have the same voice in government. Um, here's some currency, the state of New York, a $10 bill. But then you look at Massachusetts, <laughs> right here, Massachusetts. Um, this is a 12 pence note or bill. I don't know what a pence is worth, but it was a British measurement of money. What do you notice? We got a dollar unit of money, and then we've got a pence unit of money. And then down at the bottom, you have Georgia with a good old $40 bill. Yes, $40. Yeah, it looked exactly like that. Um, one of the big problems with this, it was easy to counterfeit. So if you're living in New York, you just print you off a bunch of New York dollars. Because everybody had a printing press. Well, what happens to the, if you put too much money in circulation, what happens to the value of that money? It goes down. And so one of the things the British did, particularly in New York State, is they printed a lot of currency that was counterfeit and they put it into circulation. And what happens, people find out about it and suddenly nobody's buying and spending because... Um, vendors, people in business don't know if it's real or not. And so that's a real problem. Now, um, here's the Articles of Confederation, our ship. They're sailing on the sea of no power to enforce laws. And there's a storm coming. There's no national court system. There's no power to enforce treaties. There's no power to raise an army. There's no power to collect taxes. That's the Articles of Confederation. What's going to happen to the ship? It's going to sink. And when it sinks, you've got a real problem. We'll go through. We've already went through all that. So um, it becomes clear to those founding fathers, John Adams, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, that we have a problem. The government's just too weak. The central government is too weak to really be effective. And so George Washington, of all people, calls the government a half-starved, limping government. It's not effective. It doesn't work the way it should. And George Washington would know. He's the head of the Continental Army, right? What's he having to do to that Continental Army? He's got to pay it. He's got to feed it. He's got to make sure they got uniforms. They got shoes. And Sometimes those things didn't happen because the central government couldn't supply them and the states wouldn't. It's not that there weren't enough uniforms and there weren't enough shoes and there wasn't enough food. It's that George Washington couldn't get those things because the government could not provide them. States would argue over borders. They argued over trade. And Congress, again, has 
they can't say anything. They have no power to stop them. And here's a, a, a really interesting thing to think about. Foreign governments didn't know who to talk to. Today, if Russia wants to talk about something that involves the United States, who are they going to call? They're going to call the White House. Vladimir Putin is going to talk to Joe Biden. Or an ambassador from Russia is going to talk to an ambassador from the United States. They know who to talk to. What's happening in the United States here is nobody knows who's in charge. And that creates problems. And so it becomes very clear that something has to change. Something has to be done that is different to allow this government to walk and to function the way that it is supposed to. So, September of 80, 1786, Alexander Hamilton... Thank you. And James Madison. Call for a meeting of the states. Remember, this is after the Revolutionary War. They call for a meeting of the states to meet and discuss their disagreements. How many of them do you think came? Five. Five states, five representatives come to discuss what they need to do in order to solve the problem. Basically, the only thing they decide in 1786 is we need to meet again. And so they set a date of May 1787 to meet. And during that year or more, um, they encourage people to come. They um, talk to the different states. And in 1787, um, all 13 states are represented at the Constitutional Convention. The president of that convention... It's George Washington. Why was that important? Who was George Washington? He was not the president yet. He is a private citizen. He gave up being the commander-in-chief. He willingly gave up that power, and he went back to Mount Vernon, and he's a farmer. And They encouraged him to come out of retirement, basically, and talk about what things need to be done, what things need to happen in order for the country to be successful. And so uh, you have James Madison, uh, top right. James Madison's really short, married to a woman named Dolly. Um, She was a heck of a woman. One of my favorite female people in history is Dolly Madison. Uh, But James Madison is a very effective president. He does become president. In fact, he's the last U.S. president to fight in battle as the president of the United States. War of 1812, the British attack Washington, D.C. James Madison rides out on his horse to defend the city from the British. He loses, but that's okay. And then you have Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton is an interesting guy. If you read the book Hamilton by Ron um, Chernow, That's the book that the musical was based on. You find out some interesting things about Alexander Hamilton. Um, He was a bastard child. And what does that mean? Um, It means he didn't know who his daddy was. We're not sure his mama knew who his daddy was because his mother was a hoe. She She was a prostitute. Um... I knew that'd wake you up. Alexander Hamilton is hes an illegitimate child of a prostitute. He's born not in the United States. He's actually born on a Caribbean island. Unlike most people who are born into that kind of circumstance, um, he actually catches a couple of breaks. Somebody um, meets him, comes to know him, and... Um, They are struck by his intelligence, by his desire to make something of himself, his desire to succeed, and they sponsor him. And they send him to New York City so that he can attend college. And he never looks back. Although, if you, as you read the the biography of um, Chernow, 
um, you learn that he had a huge inferiority complex. He thought everybody was better than him. Everybody was richer than him. And so I'm going to work hard. And I'm going to overcome those things. Honestly, I think that's one of the reasons he challenges Aaron Burr to a duel. Is because he feels like he needs to do that in order to be elevated. Um, but anyway, in, interesting guy. It's not until this book is written that people really remember Alexander Hamilton. And of course, the musical did a lot to bring Alexander Hamilton to the forefront. Yeah, Alexander Hamilton. Mm -hmm. All right. So they meet in 1787. And their intention is to take the Articles of Confederation and improve it. Their idea is to um, take the Articles of Confederation, fix what's wrong with it, and just go on about their business. But they end up, and I think this was the intent of Hamilton and Madison um, all along. They just throw it away. They just get rid of it. We don't want this. There's a better plan out there somewhere. Let's figure it out. And so they write the Constitution of the United States. They just rewrite it. Or write a new plan, rather. And it becomes the Constitution of the United States. Goes into effect in September of 1789. Takes a little while to write it. Georgia appoints six delegates to attend the Constitutional Convention. Think back to the Declaration of Independence. How many people went? Two. Three. Who were they? There you go. This time they send or they appoint six delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Only four go. Two that we won't mention. And I think... I mentioned the next two, but there are no blanks for them, so I think. Two did not attend. Two left, and you can squeeze in the two that left on that one little line. Two left early. They were William Houston and William Pierce. They go... And they begin work, but they end up going back home. They come back home to Georgia. I think one had a family emergency. One had something to do with business. Um, but apparently the Constitution was not as important as what was going on back home in Georgia. And I, the reason you don't have blanks is I stuck these in late because um, I wasn't going to mention them because they, you know, they didn't see it through. But these two guys did. These two guys go to Philadelphia, they stay for the entire convention, and they sign the Constitution. One is Abraham Baldwin, name you should be familiar with. Why? Baldwin County, right? Um, Baldwin County is named after Abraham Baldwin. And if you think about when, when Milledgeville was created, Baldwin County was created, this is not too long after Baldwin and Few have signed the Constitution. William Few being the other person that signed the Constitution from Georgia. Yeah, a lot of Williams. Uh, both of these men worked tirelessly to get the Constitution approved in the Constitutional Convention and then to get it ratified or approved by the state. Um, Constitutional, or excuse me, Independence Hall. It's where they met, same place they met for the Declaration of Independence. Um, what we see is, is really for the first time in U.S. history is compromise. Because the only way the Constitution is going to be ratified is if the people can come up with compromises. And there are two major compromises. The first is called the three-fifths compromise. The three-fifths compromise. Uh, the northern states and the southern states come to an agreement. And their agreement is, okay, we will count each slave as three-fifths of a person. OK? 
okay? Probably a better way to look at it is when we start counting people, we're not going to count five out of five slaves. We're only going to count three out of five slaves. And so that's what they do. That's the compromise. The South wants slaves to not be counted for, or excuse me, to be counted for population, how many people live in the state, but they don't want slaves to be counted for taxation. The northern states, they don't want the slaves to be counted for population. They want them to be counted for taxation. And so this is the compromise. Everybody gets something. Nobody got everything. The people that are really screwed are those African Americans. And if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about slavery and how the U.S. government has the opportunity to put it to an end, and they don't. And not only do they not do it here, they don't do it in another compromise that they make during this time. And that's why the three-fifths compromise. Here you go. The southern states want slaves to count in the population. They don't want it to count when they start laying out taxes. The northern states, exactly opposite. And so the compromise is we'll count three-fifths. Three-fifths for population. Why? That determines how much representation you get in the House of Representatives. And then um, we'll count three-fifths in determining uh, the taxation of the states by the federal government. So they compromise. They have the opportunity, but they don't take it. And the reason they don't take it is the Constitution never would have passed. And this allows slavery to continue. This actually legalizes, legitimizes slavery in the United States for the next 100 years, almost, 80 years. The second compromise is called the Great Compromise. The Great Compromise. And what it does, it creates a bicameral legislature where each state will have two members in the Senate and representation in the House will be based on population. And that is a compromise. And you'll see why that's a compromise. Abraham Baldwin was instrumental in helping to develop this great compromise and therefore instrumental in getting the um, Constitution to pass through the Constitutional Convention. And by the way, this is what we do today. Georgia has how many people in the Senate? Two. How many representatives? You should remember that from the first week of school. Fourteen. Okay. So 16 members of Congress, two in the Senate, 14 um, in the House of Representatives, although I suspect uh, we may gain one or two representatives based on the 2020 census. Maybe not. Um, again, that's how things operate today, based on this great compromise. Um, the reason there has to be a compromise is the smaller states are worried that they will not be represented equally. And that's a legitimate concern. Because if all representation is based on population, who's going to get most of the representation? The bigger states. States like Virginia. And so the Great Compromise makes it fair. It makes it fair. Um, and honestly, this is a problem, even though the compromise gives a way to solve the problem, it remains a problem until about 1860. Because the southern states realize, okay, we're never going to be equal in the House of Representatives. But if we can maintain the same number of slave and free states, we will always be equally represented in the Senate. So that becomes a problem. Okay, two different plans. The New Jersey plan is a small state, southern states. Even though it's called the New Jersey plan, New Jersey was a small state at the time. Creates a unicameral legislature, one house and representation is equal. Everybody gets the same number of representatives. 
Um, and again, it's the smaller states who want this type of representation. The Virginia plan, Virginia is a big state, a lot of people. They want a bicameral legislature, but representation in each house will be based on population. So they're going to be more powerful politically. The Great Compromise worked out by Abraham Baldwin and others. Okay, we'll have a two-house legislature, bicameral, and we'll have equal representation in the upper house or the Senate and representation based on population in the House of Representatives. And what do we have today? That exact thing. The Senate, everybody gets two. Georgia and South Dakota have the same number of U.S. Senators. Georgia has 14 representatives. South Dakota has one. Okay? So there's equal representation in the Senate. The House is based on population. Yeah, same thing. Um, some other compromises, and, and these aren't written down for you, so don't worry about um, knowing them, but just kind of take it in for a minute. The Commerce Compromise... Um, said that tariffs would only be imposed on imports, not exports. So if you had things that you wanted to export to another country, have at it. You're not going to pay a tariff in the U.S. Listen to this one. Just stop what you're doing for a second so you can hear. Uh, there's a compromise on slave trade. And what we're talking about here is slaves that are coming into the United States. So slaves that are being taken from um, West Africa, sail across the Atlantic Ocean to places like Savannah and Charleston, um, ports along the, the eastern coast. Um, those folks are coming in. Congress says by 1808, we'll enact a ban on that sort of trade. And sure enough, in 1807, the Slave Trade Act is passed by Congress. It goes into effect in 1808. But guess what? By that time, there are enough slaves living inside the United States. They don't have to bring them in from Africa. They're having enough children that slavery is going to keep going and keep going and keep going. All right. Thank you very much. We'll finish that tomorrow. Hey, boys. Bye. See ya.